Chapter One, Part One of the Shadow Line: A Confession. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. The Shadow Line: A Confession by Joseph Conrad. Chapter One, Part One. Dedication worthy of my undying regard to boris and all others who like himself have crossed in early youth the shadow line of their generation with love d'autres fois calme mes plats grand miroir du monde désespoir baudelaire chapter one only the young have such moments i don't mean the very young no the very young have properly speaking no moments it is the privilege of early youth to live in advance of its days in all the beautiful continuity of hope which knows no pauses and no introspection one closes behind one the little gate of mere boyishness and enters an enchanted garden its very shades glow with promise every turn of the path has its seduction and it isn't because it is an undiscovered country one knows well enough that all mankind had streamed that way it is the charm of universal experience from which one expects an uncommon or personal sensation a bit of one's own one goes on recognizing the landmarks of the predecessors excited amused taking the hard luck and the good luck together the kicks and the halfpence as the saying is the picturesque common lot that holds so many possibilities for the deserving or perhaps for the lucky yes one goes on and the time too goes on till one perceives ahead a shadow line warning one that the region of early youth too must be left behind this is the period of life in which such moments of which i have spoken are likely to come what moments why the moments of boredom of weariness of dissatisfaction rash moments i mean moments when the still young are inclined to commit rash actions such as getting married suddenly or else throwing up a job for no reason this is not a marriage story it wasn't so bad as that with me my action rash as it was had more the character of divorce almost of desertion for no reason on which a sensible person could put a finger i threw up my job chucked my berth left the ship of which the worst that could be said was that she was a steamship and therefore perhaps not entitled to that blind loyalty which however it's no use trying to put a gloss on what even at the time i myself half suspected to be a caprice it was in an eastern port she was an eastern ship inasmuch as then she belonged to that port she traded among dark islands on a blue reef scarred sea with a red ensign over the taffrail and at her masthead a house flag also red but with a green border and with a white crescent in it for an arab owned her and a syed at that hence the green border on the flag he was the head of a great house of straits arabs but as loyal a subject of the complex british empire as you could find east of the suez canal world politics did not trouble him at all but he had a great occult power amongst his own people it was all one to us who owned the ship he had to employ white men in the shipping part of his business and many of those he so employed had never set eyes on him from the first to the last day i myself saw him but once quite accidentally on a wharf an old dark little man blind in one eye in a snowy robe and yellow slippers he was having his hand severely kissed by a crowd of malay pilgrims to whom he had done some favour in the way of food and money his almsgiving i have heard was most extensive covering almost the whole archipelago for isn't it said that the charitable man is the friend of allah excellent and picturesque arab owner about whom one needed not to trouble one's head a most excellent scottish ship for she was that from the keel up excellent sea-boat easy to keep clean most handy in every way and if it had not been for her internal propulsion worthy of any man's love i cherish to this day a profound respect for her memory as to the kind of trade she was engaged in and the character of my shipmates i could not have been happier if i had had the life and the men made to my order 
by a benevolent enchanter. And suddenly I left all this. I left it in that, to us, inconsequential manner in which a bird flies away from a comfortable branch. It was as though, all unknowing, I had heard a whisper or seen something. Well, perhaps. One day I was perfectly right, and the next everything was gone. Glamour, flavour, interest, contentment, everything. It was one of these moments, you know. The green sickness of late youth descended on me and carried me off. Carried me off that ship, I mean. We were only four white men on board, with a large crew of kaloshes and two Malay petty officers. The captain stared hard as if wondering what ailed me. But he was a sailor, and he too had been young at one time. Presently a smile came to lurk under his thick iron-gray moustache, and he observed that, of course, if I felt I must go, he couldn't keep me by main force, and it was arranged that I should be paid off the next morning. As I was going out of the chart room, he added suddenly, in a peculiar wistful tone, that he hoped I would find what I was so anxious to go and look for, a soft cryptic utterance which seemed to reach deeper than any diamond-hard tool could have done. I do believe he understood my case. But the second engineer attacked me differently. He was a sturdy young Scot with a smooth face and light eyes. His honest red countenance emerged out of the engine-room companion, and then the whole robust man with shirt-sleeve turned up, wiping slowly the massive forearms with a lump of cotton waste. And his light eyes expressed bitter distaste, as though our friendship had turned to ashes. He said weightily, Oh, I, I've been thinking it was about time for you to run away home and get married to some silly girl. It was tacitly understood in the port that John Neven was a fierce misogynist, and the absurd character of the sally convinced me that he meant to be nasty, very nasty, had meant to say the most crushing thing he could think of. My laugh sounded deprecatory. Nobody but a friend could be so angry as that. I became a little crestfallen. Our chief engineer also took a characteristic view of my action, but in a kindlier spirit. He was young too, but very thin, and with a mist of fluffy brown beard all round his haggard face. All day long, at sea or in harbour, he could be seen walking hastily up and down the after-deck, wearing an intense, spiritually rapt expression, which was caused by a perpetual consciousness of unpleasant physical sensations in his internal economy. For he was a confirmed dyspeptic. His view of my case was very simple. He said it was nothing but deranged liver, of course. He suggested I should stay for another trip, and meantime dose myself with a certain patent medicine in which his own belief was absolute. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll buy you two bottles out of my own pocket. There, I can't say fairer than that, can I? I believe he would have perpetrated the atrocity or generosity at the merest sign of weakening on my part. By that time, however, I was more discontented, disgusted, and dogged than ever. The past eighteen months, so full of new and varied experience, appeared a dreary, prosaic waste of days. I felt, how shall I express it, that there was no truth to be got out of them. What truth? I should have been hard put to it to explain. Probably, if pressed, I would have burst into tears simply. I was young enough for that. Next day, the captain and I transacted our business in the harbour office. It was a lofty, big, cool, white room, where the screened light of day glowed serenely. Everybody in it, the officials, the public, were in white. Only the heavy, polished desks gleamed darkly in a central avenue, and some papers lying on them were blue. Enormous punkas sent from on high a gentle draft through that immaculate interior and upon our perspiring heads. The official behind the desk we approached grinned amiably and kept it up till in answer to his perfunctory question, sign off and on again? My captain answered, no, signing off for good. And then his grin vanished in sudden solemnity. He did not look at me again till he handed me my papers with a sorrowful expression, as if they had been my passports for Hades. While I was putting them away, he murmured some question to the captain, and I heard the latter answer good-humouredly. No, he leaves us to go home. Oh, the other exclaimed, nodding mournfully over my sad condition. 
I didn't know him outside the official building, but he leaned forward over the desk to shake hands with me compassionately, as one might with some poor devil going out to be hanged. And I am afraid I performed my part ungraciously in the hardened manner of an impenitent criminal. No homeward bound mail boat was due for three or four days. Being now a man without a ship, and having for a time broken my connection with the sea, become, in fact, a mere potential passenger, it would have been more appropriate, perhaps, if I had gone to stay at an hotel. There it was, too, within a stone's throw of the harbour office, low, but somehow palatial, displaying its white pillared pavilions surrounded by trim grass plots. I would have felt a passenger indeed in there. I gave it a hostile glance and directed my steps towards the officer's sailor's home. I walked in the sunshine disregarding it, and in the shade of the big trees on the esplanade without enjoying it. The heat of the tropical east descended through the leafy boughs, enveloping my thinly clad body, clinging to my rebellious discontent, as if to rob it of its freedom. The officer's home was a large bungalow, with a wide veranda and a curiously suburban-looking little garden of bushes, and a few trees between it and the street. That institution partook somewhat of the character of a residential club, but with a slightly governmental flavor about it, because it was administered by the harbor office. Its manager was officially styled Chief Steward. He was an unhappy, wizened little man, who, if put into a jockey's rig, would have looked the part to perfection. But it was obvious that at some time or other in his life, in some capacity or other, he had been connected with the sea, possibly in the comprehensive capacity of a failure. I should have thought his employment a very easy one, but he used to affirm for some reason or other that his job would be the death of him some day. It was rather mysterious. Perhaps everything naturally was too much trouble for him. He certainly seemed to hate having people in the house. On entering it, I thought he must be feeling pleased. It was as still as a tomb. I could see no one in the living rooms, and the veranda, too, was empty, except for a man at the far end, dozing prone in a long chair. At the noise of my footsteps, he opened one horribly fish-like eye. He was a stranger to me. I retreated from there, and crossing the dining room, a very bare apartment with a motionless punkah hanging over the centre table, I knocked at a door labelled in black letters, Chief Steward. The answer to my knock being a vexed and doleful plaint, Oh dear, oh dear, what is it now? I went in at once. It was a strange room to find in the tropics. Twilight and stuffiness reigned in there. The fellow had hung enormously ample, dusty, cheap, lace curtains over his windows, which were shut. Piles of cardboard boxes, such as milliners and dressmakers use in Europe, cumbered the corners, and by some means he had procured for himself the sort of furniture that might have come out of a respectable parlour in the east end of London, a horsehair sofa, armchairs of the same. I glimpsed grimy antimacassars scattered over that horrid upholstery, which was awe-inspiring, insomuch that one could not guess what mysterious accident, need, or fancy had collected it there. Its owner had taken off his tunic, and in white trousers and a thin short-sleeved singlet prowled behind the chair-backs nursing his meagre elbows. An exclamation of dismay escaped him when he heard that I had come for a stay, but he could not deny that there were plenty of vacant rooms. Very well. Can you give me the one I had before? He emitted a faint moan from behind a pile of cardboard boxes on the table, which might have contained gloves or handkerchiefs or neckties. I wonder what the fellow did keep in them. There was a smell of decaying coral or oriental dust, of zoological specimens in that den of his. I could only see the top of his head, and his unhappy eyes leveled at me over the barrier. It's only for a couple of days, I said, intending to cheer him up. Perhaps you would like to pay in advance, he suggested eagerly. Certainly not, I burst out directly I could speak. Never heard of such a thing. This is the most infernal cheek. He had seized his head in both hands, a gesture of despair which checked my indignation. Oh dear, oh dear, don't fly out like this. I am asking everybody. I don't believe it, I said bluntly. Well, I am going to, and if you gentlemen all agreed to pay in advance, I could make Hamilton pay up too. He's always turning up ashore dead broke, 
and even when he has some money he won't settle his bills. I don't know what to do with him. He swears at me and tells me I can't chuck a white man out into the street here. So if you only would... I was amazed, incredulous too. I suspected the fellow of gratuitous impertinence. I told him with marked emphasis that I would see him and Hamilton hanged first, and requested him to conduct me to my room with no more of his nonsense. He produced then a key from somewhere and led the way out of his lair, giving me a vicious sidelong look in passing. Anyone I know staying here, I asked him, before he left my room. He had recovered his usual pained, impatient tone and said that Captain Giles was there back from a solo sea trip. Two other guests were staying also. He paused. And, of course, Hamilton, he added. Oh, yes, Hamilton, I said, and the miserable creature took himself off with a final groan. His impudence still rankled when I came into the dining room at tiffin time. He was there on duty overlooking the Chinaman's servants. The tiffin was laid on one end only of the long table, and the punkah was stirring the hot air lazily, mostly above a barren waste of polished wood. We were four around the cloth. The dozing stranger from the chair was one. Both his eyes were partly open now, but they did not seem to see anything. He was supine. The dignified person next to him, with short side whiskers and a carefully scraped chin, was, of course, Hamilton. I have never seen anyone so full of dignity for the station in life Providence had been pleased to place him in. I had been told that he regarded me as a rank outsider. He raised not only his eyes, but his eyebrows as well, at the sound I made pulling back my chair. Captain Giles was at the head of the table. I exchanged a few words of greeting with him and sat down on his left. Stout and pale, with a great shiny dome of a bald forehead and prominent brown eyes, he might have been anything but a seaman. You would not have been surprised to learn that he was an architect. To me, I know how absurd it is, to me he looked like a church warden. He had the appearance of a man from whom you would expect sound advice, moral sentiments, with perhaps a platitude or two thrown in on occasion, not from a desire to dazzle, but from honest conviction. Though very well known and appreciated in the shipping world, he had no regular employment. He did not want it. He had his own peculiar position. He was an expert, an expert in, how shall I say it, in intricate navigation. He was supposed to know more about remote and imperfectly charted parts of the archipelago than any man living. His brain must have been a perfect warehouse of reefs, positions, bearings, images of headlands, shapes of obscure coasts, aspects of innumerable islands, desert and otherwise. Any ship, for instance, bound on a trip to Palawan or somewhere that way, would have Captain Giles on board, either in temporary command or to assist the master. It was said that he had a retaining fee from a wealthy firm of Chinese steamship owners, in view of such services. Besides, he was always ready to relieve any man who wished to take a spell ashore for a time. No owner was ever known to object to an arrangement of that sort for it seemed to be the established opinion at the port that Captain Giles was as good as the best, if not a little better. But in Hamilton's view, he was an outsider. I believe that for Hamilton, the generalization outsider covered the whole lot of us, though I suppose that he made some distinctions in his mind. I didn't try to make conversation with Captain Giles, whom I had not seen more than twice in my life. But of course he knew who I was. After a while, inclining his big shiny head my way, he addressed me first in his friendly fashion. He presumed from seeing me there, he said, that I had come ashore for a couple of days' leave. He was a low-voiced man. I spoke a little louder, saying that, no, I had left the ship for good. A free man for a bit, was his comment. I suppose I may call myself that, since eleven o'clock, I said. Hamilton had stopped eating at the sound of our voices. He laid down his knife and fork gently, got up, and muttering something about this infernal heat cutting one's appetite, went out of the room. Almost immediately we heard him leave the house down the veranda steps. On this, Captain Giles remarked easily that the fellow had no doubt gone off to look after my old job. The chief steward, who had been leaning against the wall, brought his face of an unhappy goat nearer to the table and addressed us dolefully. 
His object was to unburden himself of his eternal grievance against Hamilton. The man kept him in hot water with the harbour office as to the state of his accounts. He wished to goodness he would get my job, though in truth what would it be, temporary relief at best. I said, you needn't worry, he won't get my job, my successor is on board already. He was surprised, and I believe his face fell a little at the news. Captain Giles gave a soft laugh. We got up and went out on the veranda, leaving the supine stranger to be dealt with by the Chinamen. The last thing I saw, they had put a plate with a slice of pineapple on it before him and stood back to watch what would happen. But the experiment seemed a failure. He sat insensible. It was imparted to me in a low voice by Captain Giles that this was an officer of some Rajah's yacht which had come into our port to be dry docked. Must have been seeing life last night, he added, wrinkling his nose in an intimate confidential way which pleased me vastly for captain giles had prestige he was credited with wonderful adventures and with some mysterious tragedy in his life and no man had a word to say against him he continued i remember him first coming ashore here some years ago seems only the other day he was a nice boy oh these nice boys i could not help laughing aloud he looked startled then joined in the laugh no no i didn't mean that he cried what i meant is that some of them do go soft mighty quick out here jocularly i suggested the beastly heat as the first cause but captain giles disclosed himself possessed of a deeper philosophy things out east were made easy for white men that was all right the difficulty was to go on keeping white and some of these nice boys did not know how he gave me a searching look and in a benevolent heavy uncle manner asked point blank why did you throw up your berth i became angry all of a sudden for you can understand how exasperating such a question was to a man who didn't know i said to myself that i ought to shut up that moralist and to him aloud i said with challenging politeness why do you disapprove he was too disconcerted to do more than mutter confusedly i in a general way and then gave me up but he retired in good order under the cover of a heavily humorous remark that he too was getting soft and that this was his time for taking his little siesta when he was on shore very bad habit very bad habit the simplicity of the man would have disarmed a touchiness even more youthful than mine so when next day at tiffin he bent his head towards me and said that he had met my late captain last evening adding in an undertone he's very sorry you left he had never had a mate that suited him so well. I answered him earnestly without any affectation that I certainly hadn't been so comfortable in any ship or with any commander in all my sea-going days. Well then, he murmured, haven't you heard, Captain Giles, that I intend to go home? Yes, he said benevolently. I have heard that sort of thing so often before. What of that, I cried. I thought he was the most dull, unimaginative man I had ever met. I don't know what more I would have said, but the much belated Hamilton came in just then and took his usual seat. So I dropped into a mumble. Anyhow, you shall see it done this time. Hamilton, beautifully shaved, gave Captain Giles a curt nod, but didn't even condescend to raise his eyebrows at me. And when he spoke, it was only to tell the chief steward that the food on his plate wasn't fit to be set before a gentleman. The individual address seemed much too unhappy to groan. He only cast his eyes up to the punkah, and that was all. Captain Giles and I got up from the table, and the stranger next to Hamilton followed our example, manoeuvring himself to his feet with difficulty. He, poor fellow, not because he was hungry, but I verily believe only to recover his self-respect, had tried to put some of that unworthy food into his mouth. But after dropping his fork twice and generally making a failure of it, he had sat still with an air of intense mortification combined with a ghastly glazed stare. Both Giles and I had avoided looking his way at table. On the veranda he stopped short on purpose to address to us anxiously a long remark which I failed to understand completely. It sounded like some horrible unknown language. But when Captain Giles, after only an instant for reflection, answered him with homely friendliness, I, to be sure, you are right there, he appeared very much gratified indeed, and went away pretty straight, too, to seek a distant long chair. 
What was he trying to say? I asked with disgust. I don't know. Mustn't be down too much on a fellow. He's feeling pretty wretched, you may be sure, and tomorrow he'll feel worse yet. Judging by the man's appearance, it seemed impossible. I wondered what sort of complicated debauch had reduced him to that unspeakable condition. Captain Giles's benevolence was spoiled by a curious air of complacency which I disliked. I said with a little laugh, well, he will have you to look after him. He made a deprecatory gesture, sat down, and took up a paper. I did the same. The papers were old and uninteresting, filled up mostly with dreary stereotyped descriptions of Queen Victoria's first jubilee celebrations. Probably we should have quickly fallen into a tropical afternoon doze if it had not been for Hamilton's voice raised in the dining room. He was finishing his tiffin there. The big double doors stood wide open permanently, and he could not have had any idea how near to the doorway our chairs were placed. He was heard in a loud, supercilious tone, answering some statement ventured by the chief steward. I am not going to be rushed into anything. They will be glad enough to get a gentleman, I imagine. There is no hurry. A loud whispering from the steward succeeded, and then again Hamilton was heard with even intenser scorn. What? That young ass who fancies himself for having been chief mate with Kent so long? Preposterous. Giles and I looked at each other. Kent being the name of my late commander, Captain Giles' whisper he's talking of you seemed to me sheer waste of breath. The chief steward must have stuck to his point, whatever it was, because Hamilton was heard again more supercilious, if possible, and also very emphatic. Rubbish, my good man. One doesn't compete with a rank outsider like that. There's plenty of time. Then there was pushing of chairs, footsteps in the next room, and plaintive expostulations from the steward, who was pursuing Hamilton even out of doors through the main entrance. That's a very insulting sort of man, remarked Captain Giles, superfluously, I thought. Very insulting. You haven't offended him in some way, have you? Never spoke to him in my life, I said grumpily. Can't imagine what he means by competing. He has been trying for my job after I left and didn't get it but that isn't exactly competition. Captain Giles balanced his big benevolent head thoughtfully. He didn't get it, he repeated very slowly. No, not likely either with Kent. Kent is no end sorry you left him. He gives you the name of a good seaman, too. I flung away the paper I was still holding. I sat up. I slapped the table with my open palm. I wanted to know why he would keep harping on that, my absolutely private affair. It was exasperating, really. End of chapter 1, part 1 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine